Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. So uh, this is part two of the recorded, recorded lecture for the topic damages. So in part one, we have covered uh, briefly section 74. Okay, we look at the two limbs and then we covered uh, extensively on the three cases, uh, all the common law cases, uh, right from Hadley Bazendil, and then we discussed Victoria Laundry and then followed by the Haran 2. So for part two of the lecture now, okay, we are going to look at first limb, okay, the first limb, what's the requirement under first limb and also the some of the illustrations as well as the case law in order to illustrate the application of the uh, section, subsection. So from subsection one, okay, uh, the important part, the relevant part of the first limb is the words which naturally arose in the usual cause of things from the bridge. So from this particular uh, subsection here, the requirement is that um, the contract breaker is assumed to have knowledge of losses. This is what we call as imputed knowledge. Okay? He is assumed to know about the losses. Uh, why it happened? Which is to result from a breach of contract in the ordinary cause. So a good and common example is knowledge that prices in commodity market fluctuate. So whenever the, the business uh, or the, um, the dealings is pertaining to commodity market, so both parties are supposed to have knowledge, the basic or common knowledge that whatever things, okay, whatever subject matter, commodity here, the price is very, very much fluctuates. Okay? Whatever delay, it will affect the prices, obviously. And delay in the usual cause of thing will cause certain losses as a natural and probable result of the breach. So the other party, the contract breaker, cannot say, oh, I don't know, because this is something which is natural, which is something ordinary. So if you refer to section 74, you have a long list of illustrations to go through. So I believe, I mean, I put my trust on you, okay, you, you owe me to read all the illustrations here, right from A until R. But for first limb, okay, the relevant uh, illustration will be A until H. So if we have face-to-face -face class, okay, the normal class, physical class, I mean, usually I will ask my student to take turn to read so, and we can discuss all the illustrations together. But for the other lecture, it's just one way. So I leave it to you to read, but maybe we'll try to read some of the uh, illustrations here. It's a long one, okay? Let me read it to you the short one. Okay, uh, D, okay, illustration D here. A contracts to buy base ship for 60,000. But A break his promise. So there's um, a breach of contract here. So A must pay to B by way of compensation, okay, the excess, if any, of the contract price over the price which it can obtain for the ship at the time of the breach of promise. So let's say um, B managed to buy another ship at a higher price. So the, the difference of the price he can claim from uh, a, because A is uh, responsible for the breach of the contract. But but let's say, um, okay, the if situation, okay, if B can secure another ship okay, at a lower price, same quality, exactly the same one, so meaning that he doesn't suffer any loss, even though there's a breach here, so he cannot claim. Because no losses, so no uh, damages is allowed. So the rest you can read on your own, let's move further. Okay, we go to the case now, case law. Very important case, uh, Datuk Muhammad Anwar bin Embong and Bank Bumutra Malaysia Berhad. Um, we have the case of at trial level and then the case went up to appeal. And then the case is relevant because why? Uh, it explained to us application of both first and second limb together. So it's very important. Okay, let's have a look at the facts here. Yeah. The appellants, the appellants is Datuk Muhammad Anwar bin Embong. So he purchased a piece of land with the intention of developing it into a housing estate. And then to finance the purchase and also the development, um, I mean the, 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 the company here, okay, Datuk Mama Anwar and his company, they, they applied for an overdraft facility, uh, it's like a loan okay, from uh, the bank, the Bank Bumputra here, of 1.5 million from Bank Bumputra Malaysia. And yes, it was approved, okay, the loan was approved, the overdraft facility was approved by the bank. And then later, uh, this Datuk Mama Anwar Embong, the appellant, uh, was having some uh, financial difficulty. So the funds was not sufficient okay, to, to, uh, to proceed, I mean, to cover the cost of the uh, housing development. So now the appellants attempted to sell few of the subdivided titles to few parties because he, he's trying to get more fund, okay, secure more fund here. But the sale cannot 
cannot go through. Okay, the sale was subsequently aborted because why? The appellants were not able to pass skin title because um, when he when he uh, applied for the first loan, the overdraft facility, so the the title was charged to the bank okay, because he's the charge, so uh, he's the charger. The bank is the charge, so the title is not clear. It's charged to the bank, so the the, the, the name the bank of name sorry the bank the name of the bank appeared on the title. So he cannot pass clear titles of the six properties to the purchaser within the time stipulated in the agreement. Because why? The bank, okay, the bank, Bank Mutra did not discharge the charges on the six title despite the bank promised to do it, but later um, they didn't do it. Okay. And then because of that, the appellants filed the originating summons okay, against the bank for unlawfully withholding the discharge of charges in respect of the 11 titles. So he's putting the blame on the bank because the bank is withholding the charge. It um, doesn't discharge the, the, the land. That's why he cannot get the, uh, he cannot, he cannot um, get the sufficient fund. So, and then the appellants contended that because of the bank's omission, okay, the bank didn't do omission, omitted to discharge the charges over the 11 titles, they could not on their own raise for sufficient bridging finance to complete phase three of the development project that would have assured them of the profits over the project. So because of the failure on the part of the bank, so that's why they cannot proceed okay, with their development project. So when the case was brought up to the court, this is the lower court decision before the case went up to appeal. So there are, the court said there are two independent contracts okay, existing between the parties here. The first one, okay, the main one, the principal one, being the contract for the facilities, overdraft facility. And another contract is subsidiary contract, uh, being the undertaking, the promise by the bank to discharge the charges on the 11 titles. And then the court said, if the principal contract had been breached, so no problem, okay, it's very clear cut, clear cut case of the breach. But here, the bridge actually is about the second one, okay, this, uh, the subsidiary contract. So, bridge of the subsidiary contract, namely the delay in executing and effecting the discharge of the charges. So, the bridge here for the subsidiary contract here actually, um, uh, the cause a delay, yeah, the court agreed, yes, the bridge committed by the bank caused a delay in the appellant's attempt. But then, actually, the court said raising additional fund on the part of the appellants here was very much to the appellants' own effort. It's not really related to bank's business here. So the bank was in no way involved in that exercise. So there's no way that the bank can be blamed. That's the what the court said. Okay? And then the court said, the, so the court actually gave favorable judgment to the bank. The bank had no control of how the appellants decide to use the title to raise over the additional fund. And because why? Actually, the bank can further charge. I mean, second time, second layer of charge can do so, even though um, maybe the amount will be lesser. Okay? So the court said, well, actually, the title is with you. Okay? It's with the appellant, okay? physical title, even though the name of the bank appeared. And then the court, the court said, the titles, um, the fact that the titles were encumbered was charged. Okay? It's no bar to the appellants to charge the titles for them to secure the additional funds. Okay, and then the court eventually said, well, the loss of profit that uh, the, uh, the appellants claim is not natural and not direct consequence of the bank's breach. So it doesn't satisfy the requirement here. And then also on the part of the special knowledge, the okay, element of communication of special circumstances is absent. So it's like the bank said, well, appellant didn't tell the bank okay, why they want the bank to um, uh, to discharge the property, uh, discharge the, uh, the charge over 11 titles here. So that's the finding by the trial court. So because of that, uh, yeah, there's a breach by the bank, but then um, the whatever losses here is not really related, not really directly caused by the bank here. So uh, appellant was entitled to nominal damage only, whereas they are claiming for a big amount of uh, compensation. So of course, dissatisfied with the award, so now appellants appeal to the Court of Appeal. So earlier court was actually the High Court. Okay, and this is the finding by High Court. So the court said, based on this, the court actually analyzed, assuming the whole facts again. So based on the series of transactions and correspondence between um, the parties, okay, between Datuk Mama Anwar Mo and between the bank, actually the bank, okay, the respondent knew okay, the purpose of the overdraft facility and the projected net profits to be made by the appellants from the report. It is called Feasibility Study Report or FSR because they submit this report to the bank. And then also the finding was by the Court of Appeal is that respondent, uh, Bank Mutraya, knew of the real purpose for the sick charges. So they said, they know okay, why uh, appellant asked, for the, asked from the bank to discharge the property. 
and then respondent, the bank had failed to honor its obligation and therefore the loss of profit naturally arose from that breach. So this is something which is directly connected. Okay, the, the losses suffered by Datuk Muhammad Anwar Ambu, yes, directly connected with the bank failure okay, to discharge the six charges. Especially the respondent knew the failure uh, that failure to discharge the charges will likely uh, result from that breach. So because of that, uh, Court of Appeal was of the view that the claim for loss of profit falls both under the first and second limb of Section 74 of the Act. So it's um, something which naturally arose and then on the part of the knowledge, yes, the bank has the knowledge of the real plan, real uh, intention of appellant. Why? They asked the bank to discharge the charge um, for the six charges. Six charges. Okay, and then this is the amount of the claim. Okay, um, the amount actually, the full amount of compensation was uh, 3 million, okay, 3 million 400,000 here. But later we learn about mitigation, even though there were sub-profits later. But appellants in this case, he um, they failed to mitigate their losses. Okay, so because of that, they are being penalized. They cannot claim 3 million plus, yeah. They are only claim, they can only claim 50% of the total 3 million 400,000 here. Right, because of the failure, failure to mitigate, okay, failure of mitigation. So we are done with this case, Datuk Muhammad Anwar bin Ambong. So eventually, Court of Appeal found that yes, the case fall squarely within first and second limb. Both are uh, related, both are relevant. We have another case, straightforward case here. Um, this is also to, to explain the illustration, application of um, first limb okay, of section 74. The case is B. Chuan Rubber Factories in Berhad and Lu, Lu Samui. Okay, that's the name of the case in 1976. The defendants agreed to sell to the plaintiff, so it's a sale and purchase okay, of a land together with the house, okay, and to build for her a house thereon. And hence, they executed a written agreement. So that's a normal uh, billing here. And then later, okay, the problem is that there was a delay by defendants in completing the construction and the handing over the possession of the house. So because of that, the plaintiff claimed, first uh, she's claiming for specific performance of the agreement. And then she also, she's also claiming for monetary compensation, damages at the rate of $100, yeah, I think or ringgit, per month from the agreed date of completion of the house until possession of the house was given to her. So there's a gap here, okay, actual date and also, I mean the uh, agreed date and then actual um, date okay, of completion. Being the amount of rent, so 100 ringgit here is the amount of rent which she had to pay for her living accommodation. So he, she has to find um, another house okay, to rent, to wait, okay, and uh, she wait. She, she had to wait for the house to be completed. And the court said, this is judgment of the court. The court referred to Henley Bessendale. Okay? In our judgment, damages recoverable for breach of contract for delay in the completion of, of an ordinary dwelling house required for personal occupation, okay? So it comes within the first branch, okay? So you have the, the first branch, the first limb, the first head, okay? Of the rule in Hadley Bessendale. And as far as the case was concerned, it includes the reasonable cost of living accommodation or living elsewhere. And if wherever possible, possible okay? The cost of storing furniture, okay? Whatever related expenses, provided it was in fact incorrect. So can claim from the uh, contract breaker. Okay, and then yes, there was sufficient evidence okay, on the part of the plaintiff that she actually paid the rent. Okay, and then um, evidence was not challenged, so the court allowed the claim of hundred ringgit per month for the relevant period. Okay, we are done with the first limb. So next part, we are going to cover second limb. Okay, so thanks a lot. So I'll see you in part three of the uh, lecture. Okay, assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.